All right, so I'm so excited to be back. This is our last session, and so we want to go back to this idea of the simple life. Because where we've been is back in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where God is one and we've nailed that into the ground. The fact that he is one, all the other gods that we search for, the ones we look for in ourselves and the times we try to be God, that's not working. And so he's saying, come and be still because I am the one God. That's the way you were designed to be and then give everything. So this morning we spent time saying, what does it look like to give all of ourselves? It can't be just with our minds or just with our hearts or just with our souls, but all of ourselves. So tonight, or I guess it's this afternoon, this next session, last session, we're going to be like, ask, how do we do that? How? And so we're going to get really practical. And where we're going to go is back to those verses in Deuteronomy. And we're back in Deuteronomy 6. And we just finished with, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. And this is where we're going to go today. And these words that I have commanded you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit and when you... When you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you, walk, when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hands and you shall, but they shall be as a frontlet between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And I don't know how y'all feel about like writing stuff on your hand and putting it on your forehead, but that's not where we're going this morning. But this idea of surrounding your life with this prayer of recommitment, saying God is one, so I'm going to love with all of me. Remember the Jewish people, they would have said that in the morning and in the evening, that prayer, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And as they would repeat it out loud, they would say to one another, remember, remember what God has done for us, that he's one God. So even though we don't feel like it, We're going to love him with all of our hearts. And to help us remember that, we're going to put it everywhere, on the doorposts, on our hands, on our foreheads. When we look at one another, that's what we're going to see and what we're going to think. And so practically today, I want to introduce the three Ds, and that's how we're going to do it. And that's discipline, delight, and then desire. I told David Peck that I was talking about discipline, and he's like, that's not fun. And so it's not, but delight is and desire is, but we start with discipline. And if you think about how our life works, if I didn't have discipline, I would have slept till noon. I would have eaten a lot of cake. I'd have had a ton of Diet Coke because that's my favorite thing. And just imagine what your day would be like if you had no discipline. You like forgot all rules, forgot all goals or commitments. If it were warm, it'd be spent by the pool, but that will not get us very far in life. But discipline is what keeps us going. It keeps us on track. And then out of discipline, you have delight. Now, earlier today, I talked about running cross country when I lacked a lot of discipline. We'd run to the park and play instead of running. But the people who actually liked running, they would run hard, and then they'd start to like it, and then they would desire to run. But I never got past step one. So there is no desire and there is no delight. And so this idea of discipline, it's, it's the engine that we let control what we do. And so often we let emotion, how we feel about something, control what we do. Especially when it comes to our relationship with God. So instead of what we feel like, I don't feel like spending time in the Word. I don't feel like trusting God in this saying, no, discipline is the engine, and what I feel about it is way back at the caboose. And I love seeing these shirts around, be strong, because it, Joshua 1.9 says, be strong and courageous. It doesn't say feel strong and courageous. It doesn't say want to feel strong and courageous. It says be strong, or in other words, just do it. And so that discipline is that part of ourselves that says, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like bringing my thoughts and taking them captive. I don't feel like being still, but saying, I'm going to be still. And out of that flows delight. Because when we're still enough, when we go sit in that McDonald's like we talked about last night, we find there's a lot of delight especially in the presence of God. And as we're still in the presence of God, naturally we desire more of that. And to keep moving along, discipline comes back. 
but I don't know what it is about with our relationship with God or I don't feel like doing this, but we don't operate that like that in our, another, any area of our life. Think about a teenager when they sleep in during the summer. You're like, you don't feel, like you need to wake up. Like no matter what, you get up in the morning and we're gonna do this and you create work for a teenager to do. My little brother's right here, he's 15. He's always having something on his list. But it's because even though you don't feel like it, you need to learn discipline. And so in the same way that we teach our children, this is just what we do. There's a place with our relationship with God and our chaotic world where everything's complicated. We have all these competing gods to come back and say, I'm here. I don't know what to do, God, but I'm here. I'm disciplining myself. So I really began to wrestle with this idea of, How do we discipline ourselves? I could stand up here and say, we need to be in the word. We need to be praying. But the issue that came up, and I was like, where do we need to spend time this last lesson? Because those are things we know. We just need to do them. But where I want to camp out is the idea of community. Because so oftentimes we know what to do and we know like what we need to think, but we come to church and we're just so perfect. You know, we, we, we polish ourselves and the people that should be encouraging us and like keeping us on, in line and saying, remember this, be still, don't worry, I'm here with you. We pretend like everything's okay in front of them. And I remember the first time I experienced community it was my freshman year in college and I didn't know anyone at Baylor and so I decided to join a small group. So I went into the small group and I sat down and we had a really nice leader. But she was just socially unaware. So she didn't guide the conversation in any way. So you have six really or ten really shy girls sitting in a circle being like, what did I just do? Why am I here? So finally, after what felt like eternity, she said, let's facilitate community. And why don't we all share something we're really struggling with? And I remember thinking, can we, like, talk about our Facebook likes or say if we have boyfriends or maybe even just, like, start with our names? But anyways, the question was, what do you really struggle with? And the first girl, Hannah, who stood by me in my wedding, and I judged her hardcore right here, but she said, I'm really just struggling with prayer, and I really want to go deeper into the heart of God. And I was like, wow, that's a really good struggle. And then the next girl came, and she says, I'm really just struggling. I feel like I should be memorizing more scripture and just taking the word and like eating it like Jeremiah did. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like my struggles are not like that. And so I'm thinking, what did I just join? The perfect club? And so I'm freaking out. And then it comes to this girl named Nancy. Praise the Lord for Nancy. She starts and she says, well, y'all have really good struggles, but mine are just kind of different. I really struggle with dirty dancing. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, what? how did we just get from the heart of God and putting scripture and eating it to dancing in the club? But she starts rambling. She says, I don't know what to do, but is it one of those gray areas like where I should, like I can do it depending on like where you go to church? Or does God really say dirty dancing's bad? And then she got a Romans 7 on us. I do what I don't want to do. She says, on Sunday, I decide it's really bad. But then on Friday, I'm back in the club. And I was just like, who are you? Can I know you? You have a real struggle. You, you know what life is. Nancy is my best friend now. And what I... Her dancing is under control. Don't worry. She lives, works in corporate Dallas, and she has changed a lot. But her ability to say what she thinks and what really, she's really struggling with hasn't. And what happened over the next five and a half years with those girls that I spent just every week getting together and confessing is basically what we did, is I learned the value of transparency, that vulnerability leads to community. And if we don't have community, we don't have anyone holding us to discipline, which leads to delight. And then we have desire for God. And we have so many distractions around us. Does anyone get distracted? Okay, on the way here, My mom picked me up, and I flew into Tulsa, and she picked me up in Tulsa. We drove all the way to Joplin. What's that, like an hour and a half? And then we got dinner at Chick-fil-A, and then we got back in the car. I love Chick-fil-A. So then I had it today, too. So got 
twice. So we get back in the car, and we're like, we just have one hour to Springfield. We're just talking, driving, I'm driving, I'll take the blame. We get back to the tollway, which is 57 miles towards Tulsa. And we're just like, oh my goodness. So we talk to the toll guy, and he's like, well, you just got to turn around. You got to go further out of the way and then come back. And we spent, we had $1 of cash left. And I don't know how much we spent because just to turn around is like three different tolls. Finally got home two hours after we were supposed to. But it's this idea of we have so many distractions. We have so many responsibilities. We have so many things we have to do. And so we might not desire to be still and know that I'm God. So that's where community comes in. It brings in the reins. But community requires vulnerability. And I don't know what it is about the Christian life, but it's so hard to say that it's hard. I remember when I first heard the simple life, I was saying, I want the simple life, but the Christian life is not simple. It's so hard. I, I go to school for this, and I still don't know what it means. But the simple truth of God is one, and he desires all of us is simple. And contrary to everything the world tells us, we have to have people to remind us. Because they're distracted people. But to create community requires vulnerability. And scripture says that we are to bear one another's burdens. And I think so oftentimes we think church, we bring a suitcase with us to church and before we leave home, we toss in our insecurities, everything we're dealing with, maybe home life isn't that great or our children's are, children are calling us those problems or we don't like the way we look. And so we pile it all in a suitcase and we zip it up. And you come to church, you tug it along and maybe you get an argument on the way to church and so you stuff that in the front of the suitcase. And then you get to church, and it's like baggage check at the door out there in the foyer. So you check your bag, and then you walk in, and you sit down, and you're like, good thing I left my suitcase out there because all these people are perfect. They have nothing with them. But in reality, everything we're dealing with and struggling with is back in the foyer. And so this idea of loving God with all of us means that we love him with our junk, too. Everything we're dealing with, everything we're struggling with, that's part of all of us. Scripture says that we should also love one another as Christ has loved us. And so I think we can attest in this place that the best part of Christ's love is that it is holistic. He loves all of me. He loves the self that I'm presenting to you. He, knows, he loves the self that my husband knows. He loves the self that gets grumpy after 1030 at night. He loves all of me. And so if we're to bear one another's burdens and love as Christ has loved, that means we have to know one another holistically. That's so hard. Because again, it goes back to requiring vulnerability. And so when it says to bear one another's burdens, I think there's part of us that's needed to bear our burdens. In the sense, not that we carry it alone, but that we bear our burdens. We let people in. We allow ourselves to say, it's not okay. I don't feel like discipline this week. I'm not desiring God and I don't know what to do next. There's no delight. Or home sucks. Sorry, mom. <laughs> that is banned at our house. <laughs> so we have to have community. And so I think when we bring our baggage into church and we allow ourselves vulnerability, we say, I'm going to walk down this aisle, but then there's someone who comes and picks up our load. As we go to our seat, it gets lighter now. And so we recognize that burden over there, and so we pick it up. And as we sit to our, go to our seat down the aisle, we say, I know what that's like. And those simple words bring comfort. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the resident chaplain in a girl's dorm, and I started my job, and a week later, all the girls moved in, and it was really hard to plan. Like, how do you plan for people you don't know yet? Well, the semester unfolded, and one of the first weeks of school, all these girls wanted to meet, and so we'd go to coffee, and they'd start talking. I wasn't quite sure what they wanted to talk about, but this one particular girl, the conversation moved around, and she said, I don't like college. It's hard. It's not fun. Everyone has friends and I don't. I don't feel like it, this is home. I want to be home. 
So I talked to her, and she went on her way, and then the next girl sat down. And I was hearing the same story over and over. All these girls felt like this wasn't the place for them, that they didn't have the community they had back home. And so I was just thinking, if these girls could meet each other, they'd be best friends because they're both wanting friends. But what I realized was that some of them knew each other. So they were present and community was available, but because they didn't have any sort of way to communicate vulnerability, they didn't know that they were wanting friends. They're trying so hard to be perfect. And so I created a small group and it was called Home Base because it was supposed to be homey. I, maybe the name, I shouldn't have told you that. It's embarrassing marketing. So it was Home Base, and I said, I sent out this email, and I said, I put a lot of time into it because basically I was inviting 600 girls to a lonely club. So <laughs> Clayton edited it, and I shouldn't let him edit anything, but. <laughs> He did. And so I say, if you're struggling here at Baylor, if you don't feel like you're having fun, if you, if you want deeper relationships, if you're really homesick, come to my apartment at 7 on Tuesday. I expected three girls to come. I made 12 cookies, being optimistic. That night, over 30 girls came. And remember, we're in a 400-square-foot apartment, and our living room is 200 square foot, and our kitchen is in our living room. So it was just not a good scenario. And we had 30 girls here, and they started to go around. Because I asked them, what about that email made you come tonight? And the girls were saying the same things. I don't feel like this is home. I'm not enjoying this. I want to move back to my hometown. I just want my family. And I can't get on Facebook because everyone is so happy. And so I get depressed when I see everyone taking pictures with friends. And I'm thinking, you have pictures with friends on your Facebook too. I was like, do you see that y'all are having this disconnect from reality that you all are experiencing and what's actually happening? And so there's a girl that got towards the end and she said, I thought I was the only one, but I'm not. I was like, that's community. That moment when you realize you're not alone, but instead there are a lot of people who desperately need the same relationships that you need. They need someone to hold them to discipline, desire, and delight. There's one of my favorite C.S. Lewis quotes said, A friendship is born when one friend says to another, You too? I thought I was the only one. And so if we're going to take this idea of one God with all of ourselves, we need discipline. And since David Peck doesn't like that word, We're going to say community (laughs) because community is what's going to tie us to being diligent in the word. And as we started last night, do you remember whenever I was talking about Clayton hating mornings and this moment like we've all had where you're just trying to get by and you go through the drive through and you get your sustenance for the day and you're on and you might make it by, but it's not a good morning. But instead, maybe we go in and sit inside McDonald's. So dwelling in the Lord means we sit down, we spend our day there, and everything we need to do for the day, we do from inside McDonald's. And if you weren't here, that's really confusing. I just heard it in my head. (laughs) So the place of, the way that we indwell God, the imagery of, instead of going through the drive-thru and getting what you need from God, instead to go in and sit down with him and spending your entire day there. And so let's go back there. I brought a McDonald's coffee cup. They don't make these a ton, but my grandparents, I told you they go spend time there each day, they have these coffee cups. And it's free coffee if you buy the cup. And every time I think about that, I'm like, that's awesome. But I wouldn't, my days are so hectic, my life is so complicated that I would never remember the cup, let alone go inside. Because a complicated life is just a drive through Just get what you need. Just get the, the, the encouragement from Sunday morning and go on your way. Or if you spend time in the morning, maybe it's you spend 10 minutes in the morning in the Word and then you just go on your way. But instead, we're to dwell. And so when I picture my grandparents, they remember their cup. And they go in and they sit down at the table at McDonald's. And 
let's say this is our life, our heart. Who we are is this McDonald's cup. There's nothing fancy about it. But in order to get coffee, one, you have to show up. You have to go to McDonald's. You have to go to the Lord. And you can't go to anything else. One time my mom was using this cup, shook it into Burger King, asked for coffee, and she, they were saying no. And she says, no, like this cup, I know you don't see it a lot, but it's free coffee. You buy the cup and you get free coffee. So she's arguing, arguing with the Mc, or Burger King guy. It's like, no, ma'am, only McDonald's, free coffee. <laughs> we're competitors. So we can't go to these other things. We can't go to ourselves looking to be filled up. We can't go to other people, our children, our spouse, our job. It's, this is only for McDonald's. This is only for the Lord. And then when I think when you go up and you ask for coffee, you just show up and they give it to you. Last night we talked about dwelling in the Lord is to be still, to cease striving, and that word picture of loosening your grip. You don't need to go grind the beans in the back. They're going to give you the coffee. And so there's a message of being still and just showing up and handing it to the Lord. There's also, if you were to have, say, half I don't know, orange juice in here, coffee, and go hand it and say, you know, I just want half a cup. They'd be like, empty out what you have. That's disgusting. So we're not supposed to bring half of something we've got from home. Like, an empty cup is best. And also, I think so often we, we go through the drive through and in the same way Clayton left his coffee cup because it took too long to get cold. He likes colder coffee, not hot. We have to take our coffee and let it cool a little bit before we can drink it. And so that takes time. That's where the discipline comes in order to delight. And then you can't store up coffee. It's not like you can come once a week and say, fill this up to the top and I'm good for the week. That's disgusting. So I think that we do that sometimes with church. We say, come, and I'm going to get so motivated on Sunday, and then I'm going to sip on it all week. So then you just have cold, gross coffee. So in the same way that you show up every morning to get coffee in this cup, we need to show up every day with the Lord. And then also, I think sometimes we say, I am not full, I'm empty, why doesn't McDonald's just come to me? Do you know people like that? Everything is going so right, and God is so far, and, you know, I'm just done with him. And I'm saying, have you delighted yourself in the Lord? Have you disciplined in order to delight? Have you shown up? Have you put an empty cup of coffee forward? Have you ceased striving? And then there's also the tendency to say, wow, this is a really old cup. No one else brings these cups. If you look around, you don't see them very often. And it's because the people that go, the people that are older and go at 6 a.m., and they spend all day there because they're the ones who have it figured out. But it's not like this. And then also there's the tendency to say, my cup is so empty. I don't have anything to bring. But God says, just bring yourself. And empty is perhaps even best. To say, I'm going to fill myself up with coffee and then all day drink on it, go back, get more. It's whenever I need him, he is near. And then by the end of the day, when you're dry, it's so great because he's still there. He's still there. And so t this weekend, as we return to the simple life, I just want to emphasize the fact that the Christian life is hard and how better to be doing it with a group of women like this. Y'all are so loving, so encouraging. You have so much fun. And here you spend an entire weekend saying, I'm really tired. I need to retreat and return to the simple life. And the simple life is one God with all of ourselves. I'm going to pray for us. 
Dear Holy Father, I thank you so much for this weekend, for this weekend to retreat into who you are. I pray that we leave this building refreshed. And God, out of that would our love flow into you with all of ourselves and that we would glorify you, the one true God. You are so good, and I just thank you so much for this church and what they're doing and the community that they already have. I pray that you would deepen it, that they would hold each other to remember one God, all of self. You are so good, and we love you so much. Amen.